All right, here we go. Good morning. It is the DFS Early Bird. Awesomeo.com. Dave Lochran filling in for Dan Strap. Well, not filling in, hosting for the absent Dan Strafford. Filling in for Dan Strafford is Adam Shar at Ship My Money DFS on the Twitter machine. You can follow me at Lofty underscore D, L O U G H Y underscore D. Bringing you a, uh, an early podcast for this nine game basketball slate. Adam, we got nine games. Uh, it looks like Carmelo Anthony, by the way, has played his last game in Houston. And fortunately, that's not something we have to worry about. But we do have to first at least touch on some of these injuries because Westbrook is out. Jimmy Butler, we don't know what the deal is. I don't think he's expected to make his uh, debut until until Wednesday with the with the Sixers. Uh, Aaron Gordon is going to be questionable. Anything else? There are a lot of injuries for this slate. Uh, you meant, Yeah, you mentioned Aaron Gordon questionable. That's obviously a big one. Miritich and Peyton both questionable for New Orleans. Jimmy Butler obviously traded. So Saric, Covington are questionable. Wiggins is questionable. There are a ton of moving pieces on the slate. Yeah, exactly. And you have Covington and Saric. I don't know if you just mentioned that, but Covington and Saric, uh, that's another piece or two pieces where you could see some lack of depth. Uh, Teague is already ruled out. God, We'll get into all of this throughout the show. There's Golden State injuries, Doncic, uh, Curry. Uh, there's just so much, so we'll be sure to touch on all that. And, of course, tune in to the deeper dive. 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. It's a free live stream, right? And you can also uh, get a free month – I'm sorry, a free week of premium content at awesomemode.com if you just use Early Bird as the promo code. All right, Adam, let's jump into it. Go position by position here. Uh, point guard. We have no Russell Westbrook and we have no Stephen Curry. So what that means is that Ben Simmons on DraftKings is your most expensive point guard at 9K. Yeah, and it's a decent spot against Miami. We've seen Miami not be as good defensively this year, at least, you know, at times as they have been in the past. I, I do like the price tag for Simmons. He's someone that does give you a high floor, high ceiling, and then, you know, not having Covington, not having Dario Saric, and I assume not having Jimmy Butler yet, there should be more shots for Simmons, probably a couple of more minutes. So I think it is a really fair price tag for Simmons. So, uh, by the way, let me fix my microphone here, uh, make sure it doesn't sound bad. I think I had the wrong one plugged in. So I'll do what I can to fix that. Um, Adam. Tell me how this sounds. Are we working now? Yeah, it sounds, it sounds better now. All right. Yeah, you sound, you sound I had good. AirPod. All right, sounds good. Um, I, think, I think looking at someone like uh, Ben Simmons is interesting, but I just still don't know how much love I have for a guy that really doesn't appear to be aggressive right now. I mean, he has taken 15 shots in back-to-back -back games. That's nice. Uh, and this is not the toughest matchup with Miami. How do you think the matchup between Embiid and Whiteside goes down? Because I think as that matchup goes, Ben Simmons goes to a large extent. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that I, to me, Whiteside's the kind of guy that probably should have trouble defending Embiid. You know, and Embiid's not reliant on scoring around the rim. And anyone who can pull Whiteside away from the basket and make him defend you away from the rim, it, it always concerns me as far as Whiteside's, you know, effectiveness defensively. So I think it's a spot where Embiid, you know, theoretically should do well. I'm quickly pulling up now uh, to see, you know, how he's done in the past. Not, not that that means everything, but especially with centers, I think that it is worth looking at. But I, to me, it's a spot where, where Embiid should be able to have success. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, you, know, you always see him put up monster numbers against Andre Drummond. Uh, him and Whiteside are relatively similar players. So he's be actually been, he's been pretty not great against him. Uh, he, he's faced him four times since the start of the 2016 season. He's just eyeballing it. It looks like he's probably averaging like one point. I, on a permanent basis, I guess he's been okay. 36 fantasy points in 23 minutes, 41 in 31, 40 in 30, 31 in 28. So he's probably averaging like 1.4. It's just that he hasn't right. played that many minutes in a lot of them. And given that he's averaging like 36 minutes a game, 1.4 comes out to around 50 fantasy points. Not really enough, but we'll get to him when we talk about centers. Uh, and Bede's price has come down significantly on DraftKings. So that'll definitely be an interesting talking point once we get there. Uh, outside of Simmons, though, who I think is in an interesting spot. I don't love him just because he's still expensive. 
uh, but he's in a fine spot. Uh, what about the rest of these top tier guys? John Wall at home against Orlando. He's 8,600. Zach Levine. Well, we'll talk about Levine at shooting guard. Uh, Kyle Lowry at home against New Orleans is 8,400. Anyone stick out to you in this price range? As weird as it sounds, especially for a podcast that you and you and I are on, because we both generally have the same feelings about John Wall, yeah. I've been rostering him pretty frequently lately, and it's going pretty well, and we haven't really even seen a ceiling game out of him yet. But these Washington starters, particularly Wall and Beal, you know, we've seen flexible front court rotations, but Wall and Beal, you know that they're going to play, they're, they're going to get their minutes, and this Washington team is just off to such a terrible start this season that they're already running their starters into the ground. And in competitive games, you're seeing an easy 38, a lot of times 40 minutes from John Wall. The price tag, normally he's someone that I don't really like rostering him until he falls all the way to like $8,000. But 8,600, if you're going to give me 40 minutes of this guy against Orlando, then I think that it's actually a pretty good play. And it's someone I would actually prefer to Ben Simmons because I think you're getting a few more minutes from Wall than you will from Simmons. Yeah, I'm with you on this. I I like Wall a lot here. Uh, And Washington just hasn't been good enough to blow teams out. I mean, it it just, it's been a team that is struggling, excuse me, to get wins, uh, let alone blowout wins. So I like Wall here. What are, what are your thoughts on De'Aaron Fox? I want to talk about uh, both point guards in this game because it's likely that we have uh, Derek White, who's coming off a really solid game against Houston, starting again for San Antonio. And then on the other side of him, you have De'Aaron Fox, who's been pretty impressive. I, mean, I really like what he's doing this year. He's working a lot in the pick and roll. Um, he's driving to the rim more. You're seeing him pick up quality numbers outside of just point totals. He's 7,100 on DraftKings. Uh, crept up a little bit from last game. 83 on FanDuel is a bit rich for my blood. But break down this mid-range, starting with Fox, and we can talk about the rest of the guys, like a sub-8K Booker, $7,600 Doncic, who's point guard, uh, small forward eligible now against Chicago, and uh, Mike Conley, sub-7K against Utah. Fox on DraftKings, like you mentioned, I think is where it's really appealing. Not only is he coming into his own in terms of usage and in terms of assist percentage, but he's playing huge minutes for the Sacramento team as well. And I don't expect the return of Bogdan Bogdanovich to impact Fox as much as I expect it to impact guys like, you know, Buddy Heald, Iman Shumpert. Justin Jackson, the more of the wing type players, I expect right. is where Bogdanovich should take the minute. So I'm not too concerned about that. And, you know, even in the, the last game against the Lakers where Sacramento actually kind of got blown out by the end of the game, you still saw 38.9 minutes from De'Aaron Fox with, and he left the court with two minutes and 21 seconds to go. He's just playing huge minutes for this team. He's basically the focal point of the offense. I mean, you have Buddy Heald getting his shots, but not getting as many as Fox. You have Willie Cauley Stein, who most of his offense comes, you know, from offensive rebounds and, you know, passes into the post. So it, it's really Fox's offense. And at 7,100 playing huge minutes, not a particularly terrible matchup against San Antonio, although it's not a, a fast team but still not a great defense. I think that particularly on DraftKings, that price tag is really, really appealing. And, you know, I got to ask you about Derrick Rose, right? Because this guy, even before Jimmy Butler was, was, was gone, was leading the team in usage, was putting up monster numbers and consistently doing so. He's 7,500 on DraftKings. His price has crept up as well. Rose is still sub 7K on FanDuel, though. Yeah, more of a FanDuel play than a DraftKings play. Just, I mean, any time you get someone who's cheaper on FanDuel, that tends to be the case. But he's he's priced highly enough on DraftKings where I don't think he's a bad play. I think if he's efficient in his shooting, he can still get there. Jimmy Butler being gone obviously is a big deal. Jeff Teague being out means that Rose should still get the, the huge bulk of the point guard minutes. It's just that you have to keep in mind in these good games that he's had, he has been very, very efficient shooting. And that's not something that I necessarily expect to be consistent from game to game for him. So one, now that he's up to 7,500 on DraftKings, I, I, I like him, but it's not the fastest Brooklyn team. It's not a terrible defensive team either. You have him you know, more expensive than Dennis Schroeder. For, for example, you have him similarly priced to Devin Booker, who's point guard eligible, to Luka Doncic, more expensive than Fox. It just becomes a secondary play at that price point to me. Yeah, well, you just segued right into it perfectly. Before we get to the value guys here, we've got to at least mention Dennis Schroeder. He's only 7,300 on DraftKings. On FanDuel, Schroeder is 7,200. I get it. 
he has not been great since taking over for Russell Westbrook in his two game, about to be three game absence, but he's getting the minutes. He's going to chuck shots up. And I think you see a lot of positive regression in the assist department. And by the way, I'm sorry, three starts with Westbrook out. Uh, he has eight assists in those three starts. It's hard for me to believe that that is, um, is something that we should expect to continue. And while you talk, I'm going to look up as a uh, potential assist from these last three games. I think I'm a step ahead of you. I just got oh, it up man, for, well, for, for yesterday, not for all of them. Look at uh, that. What'd you say? I said, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, he had eight potential assists yesterday. I don't have the, the whole stretch up, but I know through his first three games without Westbrook this year, and that includes the first two games of the season, he was averaging 12.3 potential assists per game. He had eight in the game on... I got it. I got it right here. Uh, okay. Uh, average potential assist per game for Schroeder in its span, 9.3. Actually, George leads the team with 11.7. Yeah. Well, George also had 19 on Saturday. So right. that's skewing George's numbers quite a bit. And also, 9.3 is, uh, is also a pretty solid number. Like 9.3, it's not great, but it's more than averaging, what, two and a half a game or three a game, whatever he's averaging over that stretch. I mean, he's still due for some regression and a positive regression. Right. And even if you don't, even without looking into his potential assists and things that have happened in those games without Westbrook, just think, thinking about it logically, you can see that he's due for positive regression because if you look and, and this isn't including Saturday, but because I, I haven't rerun those numbers, but I, I know going into Saturday alongside George without Westbrook on the floor, Westbrook had, or sorry, Schroeder had about a 23% assist percentage. Overall this season, he has a 26% assist percentage and a 30% expected assist percentage. There's no reason that that playing zero minutes alongside Westbrook would make him get less assists. So just even not even factoring in what's been going on in those games, you would expect him to start picking up more assists. Yep, it's really that simple, no question. Uh, the value department is really interesting at this position, Adam. You have Derek White, uh, who, again, coming off a big game, it's not that, it's not that I trust him, but he's coming off thir playing 30 minutes in a close game against Houston, 35 fantasy points. And then you have, uh, uh, who, who was it? Um, oh, Ryan Arch Archidiacono. He's, he's starting this game. I'm not saying this guy's going to smash because he's not that great of a player by any means, but he's played 30 plus minutes in back-to-back -back games and he's $3,700. So if you have those two and, and maybe even factor uh, Gilgis Alexander into it, he played 40 minutes last time, 35 before that, and he's 4,200. There is a decent amount of value at the point guard position. And we haven't even gotten through the other four positions yet. There's already a few options here that I will have quite a bit of tonight. Yeah, and that's not even mentioning Pat Beverly there either at 4,100. I, th I think that with Archa Diakono, it's really going to come down to ownership for me because the minutes, are, the minutes should be there. You, they've already confirmed that he's starting. The point guard rotation is now him and Shaq Harrison. Cameron Payne's not in the rotation anymore. And there's no reason to think that Archa Diakono doesn't get around 30 minutes here. The problem is that he's not a high-usage guy for him to actually put up a good game where, where you really need him in your lineups, he's got to be super efficient. He's got to run good on assists and he has to pick up a couple of steals. So where I think there could be an issue is he was between 11 and 12% owned on Saturday on DraftKings in the first game he started. He did reasonably well for his price tag. I could definitely see people going back to him and thinking that he's just going to keep running out there and putting up, you know, six times his salary at 3,700 and he very well may, but he's not the kind of guy that's very likely to go out there and get you 30 points. So right. if the field is flocking to him, he becomes an incredibly easy tournament fade. If you need him in cash games for the savings, then, you know, whatever. But if he's popular, he's just like the easiest guy in the world for me to fade in tournaments going into Saturday's game in his playing time alongside Levine and Parker, he had a 6% usage rate. That's not the kind of guy that you worry about beating you in tournaments, but I Go ahead. Uh, but but if, if if people aren't going to play him, then sure, he's 3,700 and he can run into some steals and everything. And if he's low-owned, that makes all the difference. But assuming he's going to get ownership, I would rather just get creative and find other ways to go. I think we see his ownership suppressed a little bit just because you have Derek White, who's similarly priced, coming off a really solid game. Uh, you have Gilgis Alexander, not saying he's going to be popular, but he's another guy in that price range. 
You have Pat Beverly, who's also dirt cheap. You know, I had mentioned to you when, when SGA was slotted into the starting lineup uh, that day before they started or before they played that I think it helps Beverly. Uh, obviously, it helps Gilgis Alexander, but it helps Beverly too from a minute standpoint because now his primary backup is not backing him up and they're going to play a lot more minutes along each other, alongside each other. And we've definitely seen that. Um, and, and somebody like uh, Milos Teodosic is playing basically no minutes at all. Yeah, exactly. In the two games without Avery Bradley, where you've had Gilgis Alexander starting alongside Beverly, Beverly's played, I believe it was 38 and then 35 minutes. In the first game, Teodosic was his primary backup. In the second game, those minutes, it, seemed, it appears, just went to Lou Williams, which you know makes sense. You had Jerome Robinson get some minutes over Teodosic. So, yeah, it, it helps Beverly a lot. And that's kind of what, what you said about his ownership being suppressed. I think that will – Archie Diakono, that is. I think that will probably be the case. But my point is, is that it absolutely should be the case. And if it's not the case, then I'm just not playing Archie Diakono in tournaments. Right. By the way, quick one here. Thoughts on J.J. Barea? I need to pull up Dallas's rotation. Um, I'm, I'm pulling it up now. But he was – Interesting to me a couple of games ago when Jalen Brunson was not in the rotation and Berea was getting about 22 minutes. He got 22 minutes against Oklahoma City. So, yeah, I think Berea is really interesting because for most of the season, we've seen him backing up Dennis Smith Jr. while Jalen Brunson backs up uh, Luka Doncic. That could be reversed, but one of the two, whichever way it was going. Um, but but Br- Brunson not in the rotation anymore. We only got 12 minutes out of Devin Harris, and those were all alongside Berea. So, Seeing Berea get to, to 22 minutes, I think, was nice. The one problem, though, is that he still – it was a game where Dennis Smith only played 26 minutes. So I would feel better, actually, if Berea had played minutes alongside Dennis Smith. He still didn't. So basically it just ends up being one of those guys, if you're max entering tournaments, that if you want to project him to, to his ceiling, then – fine just make sure you cap his his exposure but I think his minutes still are pretty insecure I think that in games where Dennis Smith plays well you're still going to see like 16 minutes from Berea all right let's talk shooting guards here uh top of the position you have a few guys that have been pretty consistent recently uh DeRozan has fallen off a little bit and I say that because he's not dropping 60 plus a night right now but uh he's got a matchup against this upstart uh, Sacramento team and one that I think is going to be close. Spurs are three point favorites, 218 total. So you have DeRozan here at 9,300. Uh, we'll talk about quiet small forward. Zach Levine against Dallas. Uh, this was a good game earlier this season. He dropped 47 in uh, 37 minutes and is clearly just siphoning usage away from, not even siphoning, he is just commanding all of the, the possessions and usage for this Chicago team. Between him and Wendell Carter Jr., if, you're, it, Jr., if you've played them every night this year, you're probably up. Uh, Levine, it's in a great spot. I wish he was below 8K, but he's priced where he should be with how good he's been. Uh, and then in the same 7K range, we talked Schroeder, we talked Rose, you have uh, Devin Booker against OKC at a sub uh, 8K price point. And then you have Bradley Beal at home against Orlando at 7,100. So, yeah, this is a position that has a lot of depth, and we haven't even gotten into the 6K range and lower yet. Yeah, absolutely. And Zach Levine's the one that I want to start with just because I love – I talked about it on Saturday, but the addition of Ryan Archidiakono to this starting lineup in place of Cameron Payne I think actually gives Levine even a little bit more upside than he already had. We know he plays huge minutes in competitive games, but he's played 109 minutes alongside Jabari Parker and Ryan Archidiakono this year. 36.3% usage, 19.3% assist percentage. Archidiakono just does not take as many shots as Cameron Payne does, and he allows Levine to have the ball in his hands even more. Levine is averaging, in those, in those minutes, he's averaging 1.13 DraftKings points per minute, which is not great. But then you factor in that he has a 50.5% true shooting percentage compared to his true shooting percentage on the season of 57.5%. So he's shooting much more inefficiently than his averages, and he's still averaging almost 1.15 fantasy points per minute playing you know, 37 or 38 minutes a night. I think that it's just an absolutely – he he's already the entire – or almost the entire offense, but I think that this is even more of a boost for him, and I'm going to just keep running him out there in the low $8,000 range. 
You have to. I mean, until his price point reflects his production, you just keep on playing him. Uh, 9500 on FanDuel is a tougher ask, though. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, Buddy absolutely. Buddy, Buddy Heald is $6,600 on DraftKings. Last game, it was really funny because last year, if Buddy Heald wasn't scoring, he wasn't giving you anything. Last game, though, or I'm sorry, two games ago against uh, Minnesota, Buddy Heald scored only 15 points. Shot six for 14, which was fine, but the volume wasn't there. Willie Cauley-Stein was having a great night. Uh, but he still had 34 fantasy points because he managed to give you 10 rebounds and three assists. Now, I'm not saying to expect that, but we are seeing uh, <clears throat> some – some progression or uh, some, some progress when it comes to Buddy Heald in the peripheral stats department because that just was not there. And look at his rebounds this year. He's averaging two more rebounds than he did last year. He's averaging almost a full assist more than he did, and he's averaging six more points than he did last year. He also has a usage rate that's sitting at 25% or around. So Buddy Heald is still pretty cheap. Uh, and this isn't the same Spurs defense as, as the, in the past when you had Leonard and, and Danny Green guarding the perimeter. What are your thoughts on a guy like Heald here at a mid-6K price? He's okay. He's not someone that I love. You know, we've talked about it before that he's been shooting better than his averages this year. That is coming back to, to earth. He's down to 58.7% true shooting this year. Last season, he was at 557 Pretty quickly falling off from when he was shooting, you know, 61%, 62% a few games ago. And I think that Bogdanovich being back, it doesn't have a direct impact in terms of medium projections, but I think that it does at least impact his his minutes floor because you have another guy there that that can play those minutes if if he isn't playing well. So it's I'm not denying that he has a ceiling still at that price. It's just like I would much much rather play De'Aaron Fox from this team at a similar price to Heald. If Heald ends up in some lineups, then fine. But I I don't see him as someone that I'm going to prioritize. Yeah, I'm with you there. I I think I like him a little bit more than you do, but certainly not infatuated with the guy. Hey, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention Landry Landry Shamet Landry Shamet. Sorry, uh, at point guard. This is really interesting because if you look at the the minutes that he played last game and you look at the starting lineup brett brown now that sarge and covington are gone started ben simmons markel fultz um landry shamit joel Embiid, and wilson chandler um that is that is a really interesting or no i'm sorry i don't think he did start chandler no chandler chandler didn't play that's right no chandler didn't play who do we have there um why can't i think of who it was that started it was Redick. Redick was the other one. Okay, yeah, that's right, because they had a, basically a four-guard starting lineup. Fortunately, Simmons is 6'10", 6'11", so it doesn't make much of a difference. But Shamit played 42 and a half minutes in that game. It did go to overtime. He shot 13 times, only made two of them. On the season, uh, he's shooting you know, 33% from three-point range. Not great. 37% uh, from the field. Not great. But at $3,400, if he's back in the starting lineup, you know, this, this team is still really uh, shorthanded given the, the trade. This could be a spot where Shamit plays another 30-plus minutes. So I did just want to throw that out there before I forget. Adam, talk to me at the rest of the point guard or shooting guard position. It doesn't seem like the, there's a whole lot in that 5 6K range, but do we have some value here? Uh, lo- yeah, I mean, looking down a little bit, J.J. Redick, I think, is still interesting just because he, he should get plenty of minutes without Covington or, or Sarge there. Brown, he, won't play, Brown won't play Fultz right now in the second half in close games. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Redick, I mean, we know that he can be a very productive shooter. So, um, you know, some interest there. He's, he's not a, a true value play, but he, he's 5,300. Um, it's not the best position, though. Like on DraftKings, you have Pat Beverly with shooting guard eligibility, which is nice. but you know, beyond that, it, it's pretty ugly, I think. All right, let's make the transition. Small forward, uh, Kevin Durant without Stephen Curry uh, at the Clippers. Why don't we just kick it off with him? It's only appropriate. Yeah, the price tag really hasn't moved that much. He's still – he's $11,000 tonight on DraftKings. He was, I believe, 10700 on Saturday against Brooklyn. If you look at his game log from Brooklyn, you're going to see, 50, I think, 57 or 58 points. and that doesn't seem overly impressive, but he did that in three quarters. That game blew out. Yep. The Warriors ran away with it in the fourth. Durant is just an absolutely phenomenal play without Stephen Curry 
on the floor. Um, is is Draymond out too? I didn't actually look at that. He's questionable right now. So okay. I mean that could. It, but but Dray, uh, Kevin Durant, thirty four percent usage with no Curry, dating back to the start of last season. One almost one and a half fantasy points per minute and an assist rate at 27%. So he literally does everything with Curry off the floor. Right, exactly. And the rebounds go up as well, especially if, if Curry and Draymond are both out. And, I mean, Durant's been playing you know, massive minutes in competitive games. You can project him for 38 minutes. This game's at the Clippers. It's a game that I think is much more likely to stay close than Brooklyn oh, yeah, in the Golden sure. State. You know, so I think that – or at least I'm hoping, you know, I don't know how it'll go, but I'm hoping that we get the chance here to get Durant lower owned than he really should be because I don't think it's, it's like people just don't realize how much better he gets without Curry. You know, even going into that Brooklyn game, you have people saying like, Oh, I mean, I don't think Durant's going to score 60 and that's what I would need at his price. So I'm not going to play him. And it's just, you know, he did it in three quarters and it, it wasn't surprising. He averages like one and a half points per minute without Curry on the floor. Yeah. That's a ridiculous thought that, that, that Durant, can't get you to 60 Durant can get you to 60 with Curry on the floor so I'm not necessarily sure where that's coming from right Kawhi I mean just, uh, like if if you just look at Durant's rates in the games where Durant has good games it's because he gets hot and Curry defers to him and he ends up with like a 34 percent usage rate same thing and, with Clay Thompson they defer right. to him when he gets hot right and, and that's what Durant averages without Curry you know, whereas as Thompson's completely different because he loses efficiency, he doesn't really get a usage bump without Curry on the floor. He still has to have one of those games where he's making every shot. But Durant just starts doing everything. He's basically the the ball handler, point guard, lead rebounder who also is shooting every time down the floor. That's right. Paul George, minutes are insane right now. Uh, you know, you look at close games, 38, 39, 37 minutes he's seeing. Uh, 35 against Houston, but that game actually – turned into a blowout and uh, had he played his regular minutes an extra three or so in a closer game you're getting 60 fantasy points from him Uh, he's had one bad game one great game and one pretty damn good game with uh, Westbrook off the court that was before his price came up to where it is now though he's $9,700 but he's got this home matchup with Phoenix I mean obviously the only concern here even without Westbrook is a blowout but uh, is, is Paul George priced reasonably reasonably enough for you right now on uh, DraftKings, or is it a little bit too steep of an asking price? I don't think that – in a vacuum, I think the, the price is fine. It's a very fair price for a guy like George who you know, has a 31 to 32% usage rate without Westbrook on the floor. He's got an assist percentage up around 23 24%. We talked – you know, we already mentioned that he had 19 potential assists in that last game, but the problem for me is just – his proximity to Kevin Durant, the fact that he's more expensive by $1,000 now than Kawhi Leonard against New Orleans in a, in a fast-paced game. So I don't see myself prioritizing him. I do like him. You know, I would much rather play like George than DeMar DeRozan. I think I'd rather play George than Ben Simmons, you know, where, where Simmons has small forward eligibility on DraftKings for $700 less. But it's just a really awkward price point, I think, when you have him between a 30% usage guy in Kawhi Leonard and – a 35% usage guy in Kevin Durant. Is there anyone else you like at small forward at any tier? Aaron Gordon, if he's back. Obviously, yeah, he's think, questionable, but just such I a good think, spot for him against Washington. You also have to, as, as brutal as it is, because you know I hate playing this guy, you also have to consider Jabari. At 5,800, he's still playing huge minutes. Uh, only 30 last game, but prior to that, 40, 42, 36. One of them was an over double overtime game, but you get the point. Uh, he's going to fall into good games here and there like he did against the Pelicans, and he's still 5,800. So you're not overpaying for a guy that is underwhelmed. Uh, 7,300 on FanDuel is a slightly different story, but I do still think you have some value with uh, Jabari there. I don't know if there's much value here, though, because a lot of it's at the point guard position. Goran Dragic is is already back, so you don't have Wayne Ellington anymore, which kind of means that, a lot of the value that could be here dries up. Yeah, for sure. I think that Aaron Gordon's injury will have an impact because if he's out, you'll have Jonathan Simmons, who I would project to play around 24 minutes at $3,300 against the Wizards. You would have Wesley Awundu, who, if you use Sunday's game as an example, should get 32 to 34 minutes split between the three and the four. So you would have some value in those guys. But if Gordon's in, 
then the value really does dry up. Um, and, and I do agree with your point on Jabari Parker, not necessarily someone that you want a ton of exposure to because he's really volatile, but he also benefits from Archie Diakono joining the starting rotation. He has a 26.5% usage rate alongside Levine with Archie Diakono on the floor. So I think the upside's clearly still there. Karis Levert's also the cheapest he's been since last month. I don't think, if he's healthy, I don't think he's a crazy play against this bad Minnesota defense. Um, you know, no matter how dysfunctional they were with Butler, I still think he was a quality defender. And uh, not having to deal with Butler defense should certainly help him. Uh, quick question, and then we'll move on to power forward, center, and close it out. Any interest in a Danilo Gallinari or a Tobias Harris in this up-tempo matchup with the Warriors? I've been pretty high on Gallinari this year in particular, and this is a game also where I think maybe you see some of the Gallinari at the five lineups. It's obviously a spot where Montrez Harrell could go nuts as well, so I'm not completely sold on that. But 5600 for Gallinari I think is a, a really, really nice price tag. I always have trouble getting up to Tobias Harris when he's over $1,000 more expensive than Gallinari just because, yeah, Harris plays a couple more minutes, but you get very similar usage rates from them. A little, uh, a little bit better rebounding percentage for Harris, but not crazy. So I just always end up on Gallinari over Harris. All right. Yeah, so do I. I mean, if they're the same price, I'm going to buy as Harris. You got a little right. bit more in the, uh, in the way of peripherals. But outside of that, they're not that different in terms of production. Power forward, uh, at the top, you have Anthony Davis at Toronto. Not a very easy matchup. He's Anthony Davis. He can, we know he can produce, really. He's, he's matchup-proof to, to a large extent. But this is a difficult matchup for him. Uh, before we get into the rest of these plays here, let's talk about the highest-priced option in Kevin Durant. Or, I'm sorry, Anthony Davis. A lot for me with Davis will depend on Alfred Payton and Nikola Mirotic. If those guys are both in the lineup, then – I just can't really bring myself, I don't think, to pay more money for Anthony Davis against Toronto than for Durant against the Clippers without Steph Curry. If Miritich and Peyton are out, then suddenly you're looking at monster bumps across the board for Anthony Davis as well in terms of – And Randall. Right, yeah, and Randall, of course. You know, it, And so it puts Davis really in a – comparable situation to Kevin Durant on Saturday had them projected point per dollar wise almost exactly the same and Davis was you know 800 to a thousand dollars more I think it would be the same situation here so a lot will come down to those the, the health of those guys but it's also clearly a worse matchup against Toronto than you know as, as a defense than against the Clippers who do you like more Durant or Anthony Davis because I, I, I don't I think if Curry was playing, it'd be clearly Davis. But right. I actually have a slight lean toward assuming Miritich plays. I give a slight nod to uh, Kevin Durant. Yeah, if Miritich plays, it's Durant easily for me. If Miritich is out, it becomes really, really close. Julius Randle hasn't made a, a ton of noise this year because a lot of his production and run has come off the bench. But he's averaging 1.35 fantasy points per minute. Uh, Adam, he's putting up big numbers. And when he started in place of Miritich, he logged 38 minutes and got up uh, 19 shots. So uh, we don't really need to touch on him much, but this is a really favorable spot for Randall if Dave or if Miritich is out, not because of the matchup, but because of the price minutes and pretty solid usage no matter where he's playing. Yeah, absolutely. The, every, everything's there. I mean, he does everything when he's on the floor. It's just a matter of him getting minutes. Sites have, have been smart this year, and they're not pricing him down for his normal role, which would make him the easiest play in the world Like whenever anyone's out. And he's still a pretty easy play if Miritich is out, but there's a little bit of value if Miritich is in just because Randall can you know smash in 26 to 28 minutes. But if Miritich sits and you're going to get – low to mid thirties from Julius Randle at around $6,600. It becomes a really easy play. You like Montrez Harrell here against the Warriors? Yeah, I do. It's a spot where I would expect him. You know, I, I mentioned you could get some Gallinari closing lineups or Gallinari at the five, but Harrell would be out of the three center rotation. The he's, right. He's the one that I would expect to benefit the most. Like Gortat being out there does no one any good. Boban sure as hell is not playing in this game. It, you know, if he does, it's going to be for four minutes, and then he's going to go right back to the bench. So, you know, yeah, I, I think Harrell is the most appealing by far out of that center rotation for the Clips. So do I. I think he could really exploit this up-tempo, uh, small. I mean, the game's going to go small. It's, there's no doubt it's going to go small because it's the, it's the worst. Even if, if Dre is out, you know, you're just going to see um, – you're going to see more KD – four maybe even the five Iguodala out there playing the 
small forward position. I mean, it's you're going to see them go really small here. So I think it benefits Harold more than anyone else. And Gortat and Boban simply cannot run with quicker teams. Anything else at power forward though? Yeah, uh, two other guys that I like down towards the bottom. TJ, well, TJ Warren at 5,500. He's rejoined the starting lineup. He's playing huge minutes now. He's not splitting time with Ryan Anderson anymore. He is just still too cheap, you know, for what he offers playing 34 to 36 minutes. And then Markeith Morris, I think, is an excellent tournament play. He's $4,400 on DraftKings. The guy's not going to really draw attention because he hasn't been playing that many minutes lately. But if you actually look at what happened, He's in two games ago against Orlando, against Orlando, he was staggering in the first half, staggering his minutes with Dwight Howard. So he got six or seven minutes at the set at center. He also played, you know, a total of like 18 first half minutes. Then he got his normal stretch to start the third. Washington was getting blown out by like 25 points. The second unit brought them back. So Morris just never came back in the game. That's not something that we expect to happen. It's just how that game went. Then against Miami, He picked up two fouls in his first stint, didn't get the center minutes because he had just picked up two fouls, picked up his third foul within like a minute or two minutes of coming back in the game, picked up his fourth foul a minute into the the third quarter, never came back into the game, played a total of 15 minutes. Anyone looking at at box scores is just completely writing off Markeith Morris. They're probably projecting him for like 24, 25, 26 minutes. This guy plays 32 plus minutes if he can stay out of foul trouble. He's 4,400. He's about a point per minute guy with the way Washington is expect it should be using him this year with those bench minutes along with the minutes with the starters so i think the price tag is just absolutely egregious in terms of of his upside all right let's wrap it up center carl anthony towns oh man butler's gone i'm assuming this is a huge load off carl anthony towns back i played 40 minutes last game they lost they lost uh all five games on this five game road stretch to the warriors blazers clippers lakers and kings but he had 39 and 19 with 67 fantasy points. This is the type of production you can get from Carl Anthony Towns when he's at his best. And Adam, somehow against Brooklyn at home, he's still under $9,000. That to me is mind boggling. Yeah, I don't really know how to get away from Towns here. He's played 499 minutes since the start of last season without Jeff Teague or Jimmy Butler on the floor. 28.1% usage rate. 13% assist percentage, 21.3% rebounding percentage, averaging 1.38 DraftKings points per minute. Essentially, that's in the same ballpark as Kevin Durant without Steph Curry, but at $8,900 against the Nets. Yep. Uh, I'm not getting away from Towns here. He's just too cheap. Uh, You know, Joel Embiid, it's not the easiest matchup, but his price tag has come down significantly as well. And you you can put Joel Embiid out in the difficult matchup and he'll still put up solid numbers. Uh, at 10 one, I'm not, I don't see him as a cash play because you have KD and a bunch of other guys up top, but when he's this cheap, when Embiid is this cheap and he's playing huge minutes every single night, you best believe that he's going to be in my player pool, Adam. Yeah, no question the upside that he has. From an optimal lineup standpoint, it just becomes opportunity cost again. You know, like yeah. I, I I like Towns more. You can look to – Dwight Howard is still 6,100. The guy's playing 33, 34 minutes in competitive games. Again, he didn't close the game against Orlando because that of – That was frustrating, man. Really? Oh, yeah, very. But he, he didn't close just because that – that unit brought them back into the game and Scott Brooks just wanted to let them keep playing. He played 33 minutes the next night against Miami. Now he's back facing an Orlando team where he should play 33 or 34 minutes, assuming it stays competitive and his price tags all the way back to 6,100. Like it's going the wrong direction. You have Wendell Carter who clearly has upside. You have Cauley Stein down to 6,200 against San Antonio, which is a spot that we've seen, you know, good rebounding centers have plenty of success. He should be able to possibly you know, get blocks against the Rosen attacking the basket as well. Um, You know, so it's just, again, a center position that has so much upside in the mid range. Yep. And Wendell Carter Jr. Still too cheap. I'm going to keep playing him and I'm going to keep playing Dwight Howard until their prices come up to where they should be. Also the Andre Jordan dropped the $7,000 and he's facing Chicago. Yep. So that's another spot. It's a really deep position. A few guys we haven't even mentioned. You can get all that in the deep dive today. Uh, Behind the paywall on awesome.com, but use early bird promo code, sign up, get a free month uh, or a free week of premium content. So you can check all of that good stuff out. Uh, Adam, uh, Steven Adams is 6,700 against Phoenix. You mentioned Jordan. Um, we talked about Howard, Willie Cauley Stein, Wendell Carter Jr. Anybody else here that stands out to you? 
I mean, do you, that that entire range, and then you even have Hassan Whiteside in a you know decent spot. You have Vucevic in a great spot against Washington. There's just so much upside in this mid center range that it's almost impossible for a few of them not to put up big games. Yeah, it's just going to be making sure you get the right ones because a couple of these guys are going to erupt. It's pretty much a foregone conclusion. Oh, and Mike, Mike Muscala is back as a $3,500 value play. Right, and that's going, to, uh, that's going to cut into some minutes for – I'm not sure who, but they're going to find a way to use this guy because they're, they were down to, what, nine guys, I think, last game? Yeah, they were down to nine. They should have 11 now because they'll have Chandler back and they'll have Muscala back. But he was playing big minutes, even I mean, reasonably big minutes, even when Saric was there. So. Sar- he was cutting into Saric's minutes. Exactly, yeah. So I think Muscala can end up being one of the better value plays. All right, there it is. Your early bird from awesomeo.com, Dave Lochran and Adam Shaw. We'll be back with you tomorrow for another episode. Until then, good luck. Check us out on the Deeper Dive. Uh, just search Awesomeo on YouTube. You'll find the live stream. Make sure to subscribe as well. Uh, And we will catch you back here next time on The Early Bird.